town hall where i invite experts to talk about different issues matthew very warm welcome to you for my viewers a brief introduction of matthew matthew wenberg is a conrad stifton scholar and master student at stellenbosch university's department of political science he currently works as a research intern for the south african institute of international affairs working on governance of africa's resources program one of the continent's top independent think tanks according to the university of pennsylvania's global go to think tank survey in 2019 he worked as a teaching assistant as at stellenbosch university's department of political science matthew is also appointed as an associate editor for the journal of emerging african scholarship during his degrees he has completed a triple major in political science history and ancient cultures including sudanese studies uh, with a minor in german his fields of interest are very interesting e politics post colonial and constructivist theories peace and conflict studies subaltern studies and identity politics viewers everything i don't understand about these things but this is his area of expert expertise and uh, we have shared Uh, bricks summer school in moscow and we presented bricks innovation model so he's also one of my collaborators in research and friend matthew again a very warm welcome to you thank you so much thanks professor so before i start uh, asking questions to you how are you i'm well um yeah things are are heated but um they are improving and things have been positive so far the government has been swift in their response um and we're hoping that things will get better but we're also aware that things may get worse before they get better yes so today we are going to discuss on covid-19 bricks and global economy perspective from south africa so uh, matthew the first question for you what is the current covid-19 situation in south africa and how the government is responding to it okay so i've i've prepared quite a detailed answer on that front so yes. according to sa coronavirus.co.za which is a government directed website um it's an informative website for the public allowing us to track the latest news and policy decisions it's labeled as an online resources and news portal um now the latest stats list that 207530 tests have been conducted in south africa 103 deaths have been confirmed or reported 5647 um plus positive cases have been identified and 2073 recoveries have occurred now these are the latest stats um published on the 30th of april um so yesterday um so the western cape the province of gauteng and kwazulu natal have the highest death tolls respectively out of our nine provinces Um we've closed our borders and seaports all points of entry into South Africa have been for the time being closed um in March president Ramaphosa saw to the repatriation of South Africans stranded in China um EWN a major news network says that over 3000 South Africans are stuck abroad um with um intentions of returning home South Africa currently has the highest number of positive covid-19 cases on the African continent and that is concerning now on the 15th of march 2020 president cyril ramaphosa declared a national state of disaster thereby invoking the disaster management act of 2002 which awards the state certain powers to maximize responsiveness and efficiency in order to combat covid-19 the south african government has imposed a nationwide lockdown with a gradual unlocking of certain sectors of the economy ranging from which we were in prior to the 1st of may which was the most serious of the scheduled lockdown to level 1 which um has not been announced yet which will be the most relaxed and the closest to returning to business as usual the relaxing of these measures is said to begin today uh, we've gone down into level 4 um so things have relaxed slightly i'll expand on that in a few minutes just to give you a picture So on May the 1st today we've officially entered level 4. Um mm-hmm. level 5 was characterized by drastic measures being required to contain the spread of the virus in order to save lives by almost any means necessary within the confines of the law. Um and that's very important as we'll discuss later because it's constitutionally afforded powers to organs of state 
um, as we are a, a constitutional democracy. So all South Africans have been experiencing level five lockdown with the so-called phase lifting, introducing level four today. And that entails the following. So firstly, the first feature is a flexible curfew, which makes allowances for medical emergencies or the provision of essential services, provided that they have a permit speaking to this and declaring them coronavirus free. Evictions, on that note, the prohibition of orders of eviction have been suspended until the end of level four, unless overridden by a court. So that's to ensure the safety of the public um, and especially dangerous relation or, or toxic relationships between landlords and tenants mm -hmm. at the moment in the country. Um, still a significant restriction on movement to contain the spread of the virus is imposed. In terms of transport, public and private, such as Uber or the public bus, um, has been allowed to resume, provided that they adhere to strict hygiene conditions. So um, that was, I think, the cleaning of, of public transport vehicles um, had to be done during the um, level five lockdown. Mm -hmm. um, the fifth characteristic would be the gatherings are still banned. Funerals are limited to 50 people and main and nighttime vigils are not permitted. Mm. So also travel between provinces and municipalities is strongly regulated and requires a permit. Um, and it is limited to close family and spouses. So there's no careless traveling permitted. Um, public places remain closed, including places of worship and leisure. Uh, Masks or protective cloth is mandatory when in public. And a lot of corporate firms have been assisting the government by producing, mass producing, masks for the public, sometimes free of charge or at a very low cost. Um, and this has been a wonderful um, show of solidarity from the corporate and the public sectors. Um, an alcohol ban remains in effect and a tobacco ban. Alcohol is being diverted to produce sanitizing agents. There are again a lot of um, wine farms and um, producers of gin and other alcohol spirits have collaborated with um, corporate and public, um, with the corporate and public sectors to produce sanitary um, uh, sanitizers. Um, so certain artisanal and industrial alcohol providers are um, also part of this this uh, this initiative. As I said, tobacco sales remain banned and workplace and public screenings for the virus remain in effect. So that now that's the official explanation of the characteristics of level four lockdown in our country. Um, but the state is aware that things may get worse um, before any significant improvement is seen. Um, that's why we're being quite cautious about the gradual unlocking of the sectors. People have been praising our president and our government for their swift action, which earned them recognition from the World Health Organization recently. Um, Ramaphosa, as someone with a strong background in commerce and an intimate knowledge of South Africa's mining sector, is aware of the devastating impact COVID-19 has inflicted and will probably continue to inflict in both seen and unforeseen ways on our key sectors. Our GDP is dependent on agriculture, tourism, mining, as well as um, secondary industry manufacturing which has largely halted. Um, even the arts have been affected by the loss of gainful employment and opportunities for new work for struggling creatives. Retrenchment in the corporate sector is also a troubling reality. Um, companies also being forced to close, especially companies with lower levels of resilience and therefore unable to adapt to COVID-19 and the adjoining period of inactivity for certain firms and sectors. Um, yeah, and that's my answer for the first question. Hmm. So, more or less, uh, if I say that uh, the, in your country, uh, the approach is quite successful up till now because uh, things are improving and you were able to properly control also number of cases also right now are very less in comparison to, I think, other countries. So, it's quite promising in your country. So, the second question for you is, uh, which is extracted from your answers only, that what are the challenges and problems people are facing and to which government needs to respond immediately means uh, somehow governments are not uh, responding to those problems of the people 
that is very important for us to understand no i can completely understand and i would say that our national provincial and local level government has responded um rather quickly to the threat and have addressed many of the immediate challenges however there are still issues outstanding and i'll i'll go through those so these issues could include non essential designated healthcare needs being peripheralized or poorly accommodated at least by under resourced state hospitals which most of the public depend on so for things like physiotherapy or um you know a variety of other non essential services that don't particularly relate to testing or chronic illnesses like cancer um covid-19 induced debt trap diplomacy is a very interesting thing i've been reading about recently um written about the written by the institute of security studies a prominent south african think tank uh, with a regional focus talks about the dangers which could potentially arise from states like south africa being unable to or less able to repay their outstanding debts because of economic inactivity or unavoidable underperformance So what we're also seeing in South Africa is the inflation of certain product prices in South Africa by leading retailers which has actually prompted an investigation into profiteering of COVID-19 by corporate firms. So the judiciary is being quite quite active in this regard and is really taking private firms to task. Um we also the need for free or cheaper data or internet packages in order for home based workers to effectively complete their work from home has become a prominent concern um this has emphasized the importance of having highly developed and wide covering telecommunications infrastructure especially for the poor aspiring middle class and the lower middle class this is literally a digital gateway to opportunity and self advancement for many south africans okay so a, a very very interesting point you have raised about the debt diplomacy it's a very interesting point uh, in the uh, emerging scenario in the world because now most of the middle and lower income countries they uh, are asking for debt from the international agencies multilateral organization and this can be a debt trap also for them which needs to be seen in a broader perspective uh and uh, you know this concern of debt trap or uh, uh, you can correct me i think it's very it has been very dangerous for african countries uh, if you see the history uh, yes. so moving on uh, so it's uh, it has added quite a different perspective uh, while discussing with you uh, the next question uh, which is again very interesting because we have worked together in brics and we were part of brics school so how this covid 19 will affect the brics countries this is very important for us to deal with no, because you know in brics we have this uh, we have china and the whole uh, issue of covid 19 surrounds around china and united states of america but china is member here big so it's very important for us to see and envision what is the future of brics and how covid 19 is going to affect Well my major observation is something actually mentioned by the economist recently called um societal reset the claims of societal reset and starting from the beginning again um and my interpretation is that this may mean that the hard won economic advantage of the developing world and its economic hegemons like China and India may be lost or negatively impacted during this period of low product productivity um and complex adaptation Um mm. however this, I think this dearth in industrial production has yielded positives for the overall recovery of the planet um so speaking on an ecological agenda there are mm. pluses um in states with large primary and secondary sector economies almost endemic to 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 all of BRICS with mostly intermediate manufacturing operations and extractive economic activities um this means that unskilled and semi-skilled workers are not entirely able to do their work from home um because they need specific tools machines and specialized supervision which they don't have access to unlike the specialized advanced industrial economies of the global north um the tourism sectors of brics countries will also suffer which is a major part of gdp especially in south africa um from an ecological perspective the forced halting of rapid and unsustainable industrialization within brics countries and other major economies like the united states has given the earth time to recuperate 
However, from an economic perspective, the consequences of such an activity in a time where every day counts towards summiting the developing world designation and Wallenstein's periphery, this could dis disrupt the growth trajectory of India and China and will likely ensnare all the BRICs in a global economic depression in the years to come. Um, and then two days ago, the new China news agency, um, or Xinhua, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, stressed that BRICS collaboration needed to be deepened during the COVID-19 crisis and the envisaged crises to follow. This announcement also expressed a commitment to boost cooperation efforts to fight COVID-19. I know that South Africa, particularly our finance minister, Tito Mbaweni, has looked to BRICS for solidarity during this fight. Um, the BRICS bank is supposedly ready to lend um, South Africa one billion US dollars, um, but further movement on this is yet to be seen. Um, there ought to be similar negative impacts like service delivery, delivery derailment and a dearth in productivity and production, um, likely endemic to all of BRICS um, with varying intensity and duration. Mm. So uh, as you have pointed out that uh, in this Chinese daily, uh, it was uh, mentioned that we, we need to deepen the relationship and collaboration between BRICS. So oh, next question for you is related to that, that we see that BRICS collective response is missing on a global level. Means for me, it was one of the uh, one of the greatest opportunity for BRICS to, to take a lead and to present the world their approach towards this crisis. But we see that BRICS collective response is missing. What may be the reasons for it? So I believe that it's a classic argument of state centrism. Our state centric agendas are trumping um, collaborative agendas um, and the need to ensure the delivery of political goods, i.e. public services and other deliverables domestically to appease the electorate or our respective citizenry outweighs our well-meaning concerns for neighbors and economic partners. Now, that's one explanation. Um, our, elect our electorates are watching us and how we respond to the COVID-19 challenge during this time, and also the challenges that are likely to flow from COVID-19. Um, in other words, an economic depression. Incompetence or a failure to act could be held against political parties or governments collectively in the future. The people's judgment will be passed using the voting booth. And I think that a lot of BRICS governments are fully aware of this fact and are trying to secure their base um, I agree that the best way for BRICS to mitigate COVID-19's impact may be found in deeper economic cooperation, but what this will look like is uncertain. Now, uh, your fields of interest are very interesting. Okay. And you know, most of my viewers are students of economics and commerce, apart from the general uh, audience. So I would like to talk about uh, what is this e-politics and uh, will it get boost in a post-COVID world? So e-politics is ultimately the nexus between technology and politics, particularly telecommunications technology and its use as a political instrument for complex motives. Um, it's used to, it's when technology, especially new or innovative technology that's poorly regulated, is used to achieve political ends, usually through the spread of misinformation or disinformation or both, um, manifesting sometimes as what Philip Howard and Samuel Woolley dub um, computational propaganda. Um, this emerging field has found new avenues during the spread of disinformation and misinformation about COVID-19, with a notable uptick in xenophobic remarks about Chinese nationals as harbingers of coronavirus. We should also recall the use of, of the controversial name Wuhan virus or Chinese virus by prominent news agencies, especially in the global north, and the concern that this raised. So South Africans are concerned about the long-term constitutional impact of our government's presently justifiable encroachment on our data privacy laws um, as an effective way to track the interpersonal transmission of the virus. Experts are also reviewing the consequences that a state-led invasion of our data privacy may have on the political fabric of our constitutional democracy, 
particularly the Rousseauian social contract as expressed in our legislation, mainly the constitution. Um, and my master's thesis will actually explore this topic. Um, some e-politics scholars also fear that this is a dangerous non-retractable step towards the Orwellian nightmare in a rather dramatic fashion of the all-seeing surveillance capitalist state, which is very troubling in South Africa's dominant party system, where party politics is prioritized over national politics and the so-called public good. Thank you. Well, that, that's really, uh, uh, I'm also really concerned about the data which is being shared under medical and uh, health data which will be shared on the basis of this COVID-19, how it will be shared, who will be shared. Well, this is uh, really a very challenging issue and awareness about these uh, privacy issues is very important. Uh, so, uh, just uh, one last question for you, a very brief one. Uh, you have pointed out that there are reports and news and media has been targeting China and Wuhan virus and developing a propaganda to do that. But uh, what has been the role of media positively or negatively in this COVID-19? How do you see the global media, whether the global media has responded positively or rather taking it as a serious issue, which is of concern, uh, they have used it to further politicize this issue. What are your thoughts about it? I think that, as always, the global um, institution of media is typically, it sensationalizes news. And, and that's partly to raise awareness, I would say. But at the same time, framing things in a negative or pessimistic light is usually done in order to get us to wake up because people tend to react better to shock tactics um, mm -hmm. than a gradual, gradual introduction to, to um, an imminent threat. And so when you frame something as an existential threat um, to humanity and, and our future prosperity, we tend to react very quickly. Um, and, and what I've found is that especially with, um, I think at a domestic level, at a national level, South Africa's media has been quite encouraging, quite um, quite responsive to the concerns of the people raising that awareness and performing their function um, as, as sort of protectors of, of truth and justice in our country. But globally, I would say that there has been definitely sensationalized news and disinformation being spread and misinformation for different ideological interests or political ends. Um, and, and that's an unavoidable reality. But, but ultimately, I would say that it needs to be slightly negative or cynical, rather, about the future after COVID-19, because it will change our world. And, and I think we need, it's better that we over-prepare than under-prepare for the future coming. Thank you, Matthew. That was an enlightened session and you had given us uh, several dimensions to think about COVID-19 breaks and the global economy. For our viewers, I thank the viewers who are watching this and I will request them to like the video, comment on this video. If they have questions, they can post their questions, which I will then be forwarding to you to answer them, that I will post them there. And also, I will request you all to share the link of this video and to subscribe the channel. Thank you so much.